So I'm going to do something weird right now just so you guys can see my whole shirt. Yeah, because it's from the mathematics tour. Ed Sheeran. We were there all weekend. It was great because we did subtract. First, he had a separate tour for that, subtract, and then he had the whole thing, you know, the following night. And I'm wearing it, and it was a great time. And it took a long time to get my voice back, so I'm sorry if I'm froggy this week, but it is what it is. We are doing another FAQ today, and I will tell you more about it in just a minute. But before I do, hello, I am Mrs. Soap and Clay. Let's make stuff. How's it going, Sudzers? Welcome back to the channel. You are at Soap and Clay, where we make all the soapy things, and you are here for week 31 of year three, and yeah, another FAQ today, and specifically, we are going to be talking about labeling. Now, I know we've done some deep dives on that. We've done a lot of deep dives on that. Number one, they were quite a long time ago, and number two, they were long, and number three, I just did one, two, and three, and not A, two, and C, and that bothers me. But the number three is I don't know that I actually covered the thing that we're going to talk about today. And that thing is called, when do I need warning labels on my products? We basically approach the cosmetics labeling, you know, stuff, just really focusing on what you need and the font size and all the jazz for really our restrictions and what we need to have on the label for sure. And really used soap as an example, even though it's not a cosmetic. But I don't know that we ever actually covered under what circumstances you would need a warning label. So that's what we are going to discuss today. And I am going to be making a really beautiful batch of soap using uh, Clover's, uh, like, you know, remember when we did the Project Soapway? And I forget what it's called, but he went like up and down with the hanger tool a whole bunch of times. I'm going to make a soap that I always make, but I'm going to do the skewering or the hangering different during all of that and I hope to have really beautiful lines like he did. So you can go watch that process while I talk about warning labels. So we are talking about warning labels today. Do we need them? So first up, as a soap maker, if you are making soap in the purest and truest sense of the word soap, you do not need a warning label on anything that you do. However, because most of us do play within that, we dip our toes into that cosmetic, you know, labeling or whatever of our soaps, there may be circumstances wherein you might need to uh, put a warning label on it. Let's talk about that in a minute. First up, let's talk about the specifications of the FDA warning labels. So realistically, most of these don't apply to us. Feminine deodorant sprays, coal hair tart dyes, sun tanning preparations, self-pressurized containers, but the foaming detergent bath products and maybe the labeling of cosmetic products for which adequate substantiation of safety has not been obtained. Let's talk about that one first real quick in regards to soap or any other cosmetics that is not a foaming bath product. The FDA does not govern essential oils because there is no regulatory definition for essential oils, but they do have safety requirements in place for all of our cosmetic ingredients to ensure safety. So I would perhaps use this, the, uh, you know, labeling of cosmetics problems for which there's not adequate substantiation in regards to essential oils or consider it because they are not tested because there is the possibility for skin sensitivities. It might be a good idea because unlike the food and drug industry or the food industry, 
the FDA doesn't really have any authority to require that we put allergen or any sort of sensitivity, you know, stuff on our labels. And so if you're using, a, say, a face oil with essential oils, it might be a good idea to go ahead and follow that guidance, which is a warning label that states the safety of this product has not been determined. And I know that I did just mention, you know, face oils, which would be considered a cosmetic, but I started this all out with talking about soaps. So do you need to do this if you put essential oils in your soap? I would say no, probably not, but because we don't really know what survives saponification versus what does not survive saponification within essential oils, just to have a level of, you know, extra caution might not be a bad idea to put those onto your essential oil soaps. Now, because fragrance oils, while they do at times, they do contain uh, essential oils in the creation of them most of the time those fragrance oils have been evaluated they have gone through the appropriate you know safety controls i.e the ifra which we talked about you know day before yesterday and so you don't need to put it for that um overall i would say that really essential oils if you're using it in a cosmetic so any sort of leave-on it might be a good idea to consider it there is no definitive you know sign that we need to put that on for that however now let's talk about foaming bath products So one of the very few, you know, things that the FDA has stated involving, you know, when you need a warning label does involve a product that we could be using in our bath products. So a foaming detergent. And yeah, the, the information there is pretty clear that it is going to be theoretically a requirement. Well, not theoretically, I think actually it would be a requirement. If you are making a bubble bar that has any surfactant in it, so an SCI, an SLSA, etc. and so forth, I would say that you fall into these categories. Now, what do these categories say? So, uh, again, a foaming detergent bath product is any product intended to be added to a bath for the purpose of producing foam that contains a surface active agent serving as a detergent or foaming ingredient. Okay, so we just covered that. The label of foaming detergent bath products within the meaning of paragraph A of this section, except for those products that are labeled as intended for use exclusively by adults, shall bear adequate directions for safe use and the following caution. That says, caution, use only as directed. Excessive use or prolonged exposure may cause irritation to skin, urinary, and urinary tract. Discontinue use if rash, redness, or itching occurs. Consult your physician if irritation persists. Keep out of reach of children. So, what that is saying there is that if you are doing a product that is going to be used by a child and not expressly, you know, marketed and labeled as, you know, this is for adult use only, exclusively by adults, you're going to need to put that, you know, disclaimer on it. So that's great. How about if you are not going to use, this is not a product for children? Well, I would say that you would need to label that on your packaging very clearly as well and say that, you know, it's for use exclusively by adults because that's what it says. So I think it's probably easier just to put the caution label on it and just go with that. And we do have a secondary piece here that says if it is marketed for children, you can, you know, change out, well, you can effectively say that the phrase except under adult supervision may be added at the end of the last sen sentence in the prior caution. Now, why are there two different requirements? Well, for the short reason of that, is that there are a lot of cosmetics and there are a lot of different hoops that one must jump through or should jump through when making products that are specifically intended for kids. That's why you see a lot of soap makers just kind of shy away from making any sort of products for children at all. So I would probably, if you know, I were making a foaming detergent bath product, go ahead and just include the use only as directed, excessive use or prolonged exposure, dot, dot, dot irritation, you know, keep out of reach of children, except under adult supervision. I, I would just combine those two. So B and C and just cover all bases because again, it's a foaming detergent bath product. And unless you are putting stuff in that the children specifically cannot be exposed to and nothing is coming to mind at this exact moment, it, you have to, you should assume that, you know, Children might be exposed to it. Parents might want to give their child a bubble bath and use that awesome bubble bar. So um, if you have any potential that that could be happening, yeah, it's probably best just to combine those two caution things and put them on your bubble bar. Now do keep in mind that this is specifically for a foaming detergent bath product. It was defined. Foaming detergent bath product is any product intended to be added to a bath 
for the purpose of producing foam that contains a surface active agent serving as a detergent or foaming ingredient. So that does not mean if you are for some reason putting a surfactant into your soaps that you need to label it there. This is specifically for foaming detergent bath products. What does that mean though? Well, if you're making a liquid bubble bath, absolutely. If you're making a solid bubble bath, your bubble bars, absolutely. How about bath bombs? I would say if you are putting a surface active agent, a surfactant into your bath bombs to make them foam, then yeah, you should probably go ahead and put this warning label on all of your bath bombs. Yet again, another reason why maybe you don't put, you know, surfactants into the bath bombs because then you don't have extra labeling. That said, the labeling is what we are going to talk about next so you know the exact specifications of what you should be doing if you are using or making a foaming detergent bath product for use in a bath tub. Check out the labeling requirements. Okay, so if there is a requirement to label, the FDA is always helpful and they provide us guidance on how to do that. So we did talk about that with you know the packaging and everything deep dive that we did. Also, Marie Gale has a lot of information on it too, but let's just focus on this, the warning statements. A warning statement shall appear on the label prominently and conspicuously as compared to other words, statements, or designs, or devices, and in bold type on contrasting background to render it likely to be read and understood by the ordinary individual under customary conditions of purchase and use, but in no case may the letters and or numbers be less than one sixteenth of an inch in height unless an exemption pursuant to paragraph B of the section is established. And paragraph B is effectively saying that if the label, because the container is too small, then you can apply for a permit and they can decide how big your letters can actually be. So effectively, what does that mean? That means that you have to have some place on your labels and a different font to make it stand out from the rest of it in bold, your warning label. And this is easy enough to do for sure. So if everybody is you know, worried that maybe they need to put stuff on their bath bombs now or their bubble bars or whatever, this is totally doable. This could be uh, doable in the form of a secondary sticker that goes on to it. You could also rework all of your labels and have a panel that is just going to be used for that within your overall design, still following labeling guidelines, you know, overall, and make sure that that is all, again, conspicuously displayed. That's going to be the big thing. And again, the takeaway that it really does need to be a different font than what you're using on the rest of your packaging to ensure that it is conspicuous. And so with that, it kind of depends on how you're, what product you're talking about and what you're really wrapping, you know, it with. So I do cigar bands for all of my bath bombs, for example. So if I decided that I wanted to use surfactants in my bath bombs, I, what I would need to do is actually increase the overall height of my bath bomb cigar band in order to ensure that we have room for a secondary label around that wrap so it can be very easily read, easily seen, easily found, and not you know violating the, the rules of the 1 16th inch, which again, we did talk about in all of that. And we talked about how small 1 16th of an inch is. But overall, it is something that can be done. Do not freak out. Don't stop making your bubble bars. Let's just work it out together and we can come up with you know new labeling designs and formats and everything for your existing packages or products to ensure that you are within compliance if you are not still. So again, just thinking about these, there's a reason why the surfactants are being, oh gosh, look at that. Isn't that gorgeous? I'm in love with these bars. Like, look, I did a good job. Clover is amazing. I'm obsessed with this pour. I'm going to do it for everything. But yeah, there's a reason that surfactants are specifically listed. We should pay attention to it. You should definitely have warning labels. My two cents. And there it is, a fast and dirty. Yeah, I mean, under most circumstances the, where warning labels would be required on cosmetics doesn't really apply to us because we don't make like henna and hair dye and stuff. But in the case of specifically using, you know, something for a bubble bath, so anything that has a surfactant in it, yeah, go ahead and put that label on. Just do it regardless because on one hand, it's, you know, only explicitly for adults which you're still having to put on your label, or on the other hand, you can just put the whole thing on there. So just do that. Basically, when in doubt, if you think that maybe it might be a question of concern, go ahead and put it on. It's not going to ruin your life to do so. And it's easy enough to reformat your labels and get it on there to make sure that all of the appropriate information is there. Now, if you guys need any help 
labeling things or getting templates to label things, let me know. I'm specifically talking to the Discord Sudzers. I am not doing this for the rest of you. Let me know and we can build templates together in Canva and just pop them up on the Google Drive. So that would be fun. For other things like essential oils and whatnot, yeah, I mean, do definitely take that little tidbit of information and, you know, keep that in mind. Anytime you're working with essential oils, which are not really governed by the FDA, that's not a thing. It's probably a good idea to go ahead and put that. These have not been evaluated, blah, 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 wordage on it, just to make sure. Always make sure that you are not only protecting your consumer, your end user from everything, but you're also giving them all the information. Don't deceive them and try to hide something because what's the point of that, right? You're proud of your products. You know you've done a good job with them. You know you haven't made anything that could hurt most people, but then you're just going to end up with that one person that actually is allergic to insert whatever here, and it becomes a big old mess. So always obviously include all the ingredients, be responsible makers, and yeah, when using surfactants, making your bubble bars, put that warning label on for sure. Hope you guys had fun today. I just heard the children uh, stampede in. So I'm going to go see what they're doing and what they want to make for dinner because they're cooking tonight and I'm very excited about it. But I will see you guys all again tomorrow for a recipe because this is a recipe slash FAQ week. So we're getting a recipe tomorrow. Just bookend the thing for another round of soapy fun recipe style. Bye.